Good evening. Second evening of our London 1958 class. And clear weather. <laughs> We're going to let all the world know that London can have clear weather. <laughs> What is it that sets apart an individual as a spiritual practitioner, spiritual healer, or spiritual teacher? What is it? Granting that we were all created equal. that at some time all spiritual practitioners, healers, teachers have been just businessmen and businesswomen, housewives. What is it that at some period or other in their experience, all of a sudden they find themselves healing or counseling or teaching? spiritual things. One thing it isn't. It isn't a knowledge of truth. Of that you may be sure. There are millions of people who have a knowledge of truth. Some of them have much more than we have. But it is a knowledge alone. And it is the fact that it is knowledge alone that prevents them from being successful healers or teachers on the spiritual path. There is something more than knowledge necessary. That something is the Spirit of God realized. Now remember, we are all created equal, and that means that we all have the Spirit of God. We're all created equal in the sight of God. God has given to each one of us the same, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Actually, what God has given to us is himself. God has given to each one of us his life, his mind, his spirit, his being, and his body. That each one of us has. That each one of us has had from the beginning, before time began. But through this Garden of Eden experience, if you wish to call it that, symbolically, because of whatever it is that brought about our human estate, we have lost the awareness of God as our life, God as our mind, God as our spirit, and God as our body. In other words, humanhood consists of a sense of separation from God. The moment that sense of separation is dissipated, one is no longer a human being. Of them, then, it can be said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But that can only be after 
the sense of separation has been overcome. Jesus referred to it as, I have overcome the world, meaning this world, meaning the sense of separation from God, and now I and the Father are one. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. Now you see he is fully aware of his identity as the Son of God, Christ, spiritual being. Every spiritual student, serious one, at some time or other reaches a day, a moment of transition in which that sense of separateness from God begins to disappear. It lessens, and more and more there comes into consciousness the awareness of a presence, the awareness of the presence. This is not to be confused with having a spiritual guide or having an entity from across uh, uh, this plane of uh, life to the other. I am not speaking now in terms of having a human guide. I am not speaking in terms of having a human advisor or counselor, I'm speaking now of the lessening of the sense of separation between us and our true identity and the growing awareness of a presence or the presence as if now we were no longer living alone as if now, probably at first, occasionally, occasionally we felt this presence. Occasionally, it spoke to us or guided us. Sometimes it heals us. Sometimes it produces supply in us. And then at other times there is this sense of separation again. But as we continue our study, our meditations, the periods of separation lessen. The periods in which we are consciously aware of this presence increases. Finally, Paul came to the day when he could say, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. Now you will remember that you still have a sense of two-ness. There is still me and a presence. There is still Paul and that which he called the Christ. Jesus, you know, went beyond that. He went to where he could say, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father, for I and the Father are one. Now, for most of us, the awareness of the presence is as far as we go for a long, long, long time. There is this sense of an overshadowing presence. It is not a person, it is not an entity, and yet it is something there. It is something tangible, but not tangible to human sense. The human being doesn't see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, or smell it. And that is why when the Master said, Who do men say that I am? 
The answer was probably a resurrected Hebrew or a reincarnated Hebrew prophet. But when he said, Whom do ye say that I am? Speaking now to his disciples, those whom he had lifted up to some measure of spiritual awareness, then Peter could say, Thou art the Son, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus immediately answers, Flesh and blood hath not told you this. In other words, the human mind didn't tell you this. No human being told you this. My Father revealed this to you. In other words, spiritual awareness, spiritual consciousness, the divine presence revealed this to you. Now, so it is. The Master always spoke of not casting your pearls before swine. In other words, not trying to show your spiritual light to the human race. You remember one time when he healed someone and he said, Go and tell no man? Later he says, Go and show the priests. Ah, that's quite different. Quite different. If you go and tell man, his answer usually is, uh, no, it would have happened that way anyhow. Well, probably you weren't as sick as you thought you were. The diagnosis was wrong. Whereas the priests represent spiritualized thought, spiritualized consciousness. When you go and show them, they know that they have witnessed a spiritual demonstration. Now, so it is that you, as students, will occasionally, at the lowest level, you will occasionally have a spiritual glimpse you may not fully understand it at first. You may not even be aware of what it was that happened. It all happened so quickly. But you will have these glimpses. You will have these flashes. You will have experiences. You may have them in your own affairs or in your own consciousness. Or you may behold something of a spiritual nature in connection with your practitioner or your teacher. Regardless of which way it comes, there is a spiritual caution. Go and tell no man. Never, under any circumstances, reveal to anyone what spiritual experience you have. Or you not only will lose it, but you will lose many, many, many years of your future. It will take you years to recapture what you lose when you disclose a spiritual experience unless you are disclosing it to a spiritual teacher and one be assured who is sufficiently on your own path to be receptive and responsive. Now, <clears throat> to everyone on our infinite way path, there is the opportunity of having this spiritual experience, this awareness of the presence the experience of the presence. In the very first chapter of the book, Living the Infinite Way, you will notice that it is written that the infinite way is not so much a teaching as it is an experience. And so it is. Just to add another teaching to the teachings of the world would be fruitless. There are already as many wonderful teachings on earth as the world will ever need so far as teachings are concerned. But there is one thing lacking on earth, and that is 
demonstration, experience of the presence, experience of the awareness of God. Now, last year, before we started this class, I said that I hoped that in that class we would lift ourselves above the letter of truth into the experience, and actually not enough of it took place. This year, again, it is my hope that we will rise above this letter of truth, not discarding the letter, but rising above it into an actual experience of the Christ. The letter of truth is absolutely necessary to the development of the consciousness of truth, with the exception of those who, by some grace of God, are given the experience without any previous study or preparation on this plane. In other words, there are those who, through previous existence, have come to this earth all ready for the Christ experience and at some given point in their experience they are inwardly touched by the Christ and lifted above human sense, above that sense of separation into the conscious realization of the presence of God. That happens only to a few. The vast majority of students must come to the experience through study, through meditation, through practice, the practice of the presence of God. Now, <clears throat> to the world at large, it would be folly for them to attempt it even through study study and practice and devotion to it, for they would not succeed. I say this to you with full knowledge of what I'm saying. Only those who are called will enter. And you may know whether or not you are called by the degree of devotion that you are placing into your study, meditation, and practice. In other words, if you are too busy to do justice to your studies, if you find that it is boring, monotonous, if you find that days, weeks, months go by and you give only a few minutes today and probably an hour tomorrow and forget the next day, you have not been called. You have been called if there is something within you that keeps your nose to the grindstone. If there is something within you that forces you to study, read, meditate, in spite of the fact that there may be no demonstration visible. In other words, it is like the planting of a tree. You have to cultivate, you have to fertilize, you have to do everything necessary for the growth of a tree, and you may even have to wait five years for it to grow. So with us, when we are on this path, we may have periods, like I myself had, 13 years of study with no visible result. Oh, I had healings during that time from uh, the consciousness of consecrated practitioners. But so far as my own experience was concerned, I was to all intents and purposes, to all appearances, as barren at the end of 13 years as I was on the day when I started. The only thing was that appearances didn't testify to truth because the very next day the whole enlightenment took place in one day. 
But for 13 years there was no sign of it. And that is why I say to you, if you can stick through three, four, five, ten years while you are not feeling the presence, while to your own sense you are wondering why you are sticking to it, what good is it? Where is it going to end up? Are you fooling yourself? Is this another fantasy? If in spite of that you can stick, then you have been called. And all you are supposed to do is do that which is given to you to do each day. Read as many hours as God's grace permits you to keep your eyes in a book. Meditate as many times a day as God's grace reminds you to meditate. Practice in any way and in every way as many times. And remember this, you are not doing it of yourself. You are not even in this class by your own will. An act of God's grace had to bring you here. An act of God's grace has to keep you here. Otherwise, you can find this terribly dull and terribly monotonous unless your spirit is attuned. Now, nothing is truer than the master statement, I can of my own self do nothing. I can't even read a spiritual book or listen to a spiritual lecture or attend a spiritual class except by the grace of God. And if God's grace is doing that to me, God's grace will, in its own time, fulfill itself. So it is with every step on the way. Once we have accepted life by grace, there is no place or position in life that we will fail to attain that is a part of our spiritual program. God's plan is from everlasting to everlasting, and uh, it is on the trestle board. And it is going to be fulfilled. Our function is to accept God's grace and accept what God gives us to do until it is accomplished. Now, since you are on this path, you have the right to declare that God's grace has called you here and that God's grace will fulfill itself in your experience. The government is not upon your shoulder. The responsibility for your spiritual attainment is not on your shoulder. It is in the hand of God. Your function only is to accept the grace of God and stay on the path and fulfill yourself as you can. Now, the businessman the businesswoman or the housewife is not going to be given the Spirit of God if in their inner being they are seeking it for themselves. It cannot be that way, for God is no respecter of persons. The Spirit of God is not given to us merely to increase our health, our home, our dollars or pounds, increase our companionships. Oh, God forbid that the Spirit of God should be used in such ways. The Spirit of God, well, let's quote. The Master is quoting from Isaiah. The Spirit of God is upon me. I am ordained to heal the sick, comfort the comfortless. Do you see why the Spirit of God is placed upon anyone? Why they are made ready for it? They are made ready for it in order that they may not be masters but be servants. Servants of the Most High. 
servants of our fellow man. And so it has been that every one of whom I have ever heard, certainly every one I have met, who has received some measure of the grace of God, of the Spirit of God, has used it for the benefit of their fellow man. If you say that you love God, whom you have not seen, but you do not love man, whom you have seen, you are a liar. In other words, then, remember, the Spirit of God is upon you in order that you may heal the sick or teach the verities of life or lift up the sinner or in some way work in the vineyard of God for the benefit of the upliftment of the human race. How do we know that this is true? Well, let us examine the Christ message and its mission. John, doubting, sends word to Jesus, Art thou he that should come? Art thou? I said you were, but I'm commencing to doubt it. Art thou? And Jesus wisely does not say yes or no. He says, Go show John what things ye have seen. The sick are healed, the dead are raised, the blind have their eyes opened, the deaf have their ears unstopped. At another time he said, I came to do the will of my father. What did he do? Heal the sick, feed the hungry, forgive the sinner? Again he said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now then, what is the Christ mission? Working in the vineyard of God for the benefit of man. Isn't that clear? Then when the Spirit of God is upon you, it isn't for your enrichment. It isn't for your benefit. It is that you may say to others, this Christ has been given to me that I might heal you that I might bring God's grace to you, that I might set you free. I am come, the Christ has come to my consciousness and has ordained me to help you. In what way that differs? There are some teachers who sit quietly in their homes and students come to them from all over the world and they work with those students. But you can remember that in a lifetime that would at best be a few hundred or a few thousand because all of the world cannot travel to far places even though they may hunger after it. There are not only economic reasons, there are often family reasons. There are other teachers who do as I have done if you can't come to Hawaii to me, I'll come to London to you. And not only London, but other parts of England and Holland and Sweden and Germany and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand and all over the United States and Canada. For you to come to me might cost thousands in dollars or pounds. For me to you come to you makes it cost next to nothing. Now, there are others who are neither healing nor teaching, but who have been led to do their work silently, secretly, sacredly for the benefit of the world. They sit in monasteries or convents. They sit in ashramas. They do not meet the public at any time, and yet their influence is felt by you and by me. There are others who publish books and let the word go out merely through books or magazines or papers and who do not have a personal public ministry. In other words, God is so infinite 
God works in such infinite ways that it is not given to any two to work alike. Each one is an individual. Each one works in accord with the instructions that are given to them from within. But, and this is the point of our lesson tonight, do not seek the Christ. Do not seek the Spirit of God for any selfish purpose or with the idea in mind that it is going to do great things for you. It is, but you are going to be the lesser reason for it happening. The greater reason is the rest of the world. Certainly, the lesser is included in the greater. And therefore, if I am successful in my ministry, if I am able to bring spiritual uplift or healing or reform or anything else to my uh, fellow men and women of the world, you may be assured of this, that some of it is going to rub off on me. Yes, you need not fear that you will bless the world and remain unblessed yourself, but it rather means you can forget yourself. Do not attempt demonstration for yourself, but let your own demonstration be one of the added things that is included in the greater ministry of serving. Now, we come to an important step. First of all, let us purify ourselves because you cannot come to the throne of grace before you have purified yourself consciously. If you come to the altar and there remember that any man has ought against you or that you have ought against any man, get up. There's no use praying. You first must get up and make peace with your brother and then return to the altar. And that means exactly this. Am I holding anyone in condemnation of humanhood? In other words, regardless of appearances, regardless of how much sin, disease, or death there may be in this very room, do I actually hold that to be the truth about you, or do I actually realize that God is the life of all beings? God is the mind and the soul and the spirit, and God is the very body. Your body is the temple of the living God. Do I know that? I must know it. I must, first of all, before I come to this room, I must, first of all, be sure that I know it about my family. Remember, I am not permitted to have... Uh, human love or human hate or human resentment enter into my relationships with my family, I must, above all things, have spiritual love interpreted on the human level. In other words, before I may make love to any member of my family, parent, wife, child, aunt, uncle, cousin, I must before that see them as they are in their spiritual identity. Then, uh, having realized God as their true being, uh, then do you not see that I have wiped out everything in the nature of selfish human love, and even my human love has become purified whether it is with husband or wife or child or parent, do you not see that human love is purified when first you recognize their spiritual nature and identity and remember that you have naught against them, you're not holding them in condemnation to their errors, 
to their sins of omission or commission, that you are not holding them in condemnation to uh, hereditary traits, you are not holding them in condemnation to any form of human judgment, you are beholding, as Peter beheld Jesus, thou art the Christ, and I recognize your spiritual identity. Then after that, I can be as human as I like, because my human love has been purged of selfishness. When I have successfully done that with my family, now I must do it with this room, with my student body, with my patients. I must not, even while sometimes correcting them, and all correction, remember, must not be personal, but must have a spiritual motive. Even when correcting a patient or student, and many of you know that I do it thoroughly, but even then, it is not with uh, malice or anger or resentment. It is with love for the purpose of correction, of teaching. Now, when I have succeeded with my patient body and student body, I have to go further. I not only must encompass the world, but I must be very careful that I pray for my enemies. I must pray for those who hate freedom. I don't have to pray that they be successful in destroying freedom. But that wouldn't be prayer. My prayer is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, awaken sleeping human consciousness. Touch the unillumined human mind and awaken it to reality. Then, do you see, when I have cleansed myself in that manner, I can come to the throne of God and prepare myself for the inflow of the Spirit, and the Spirit will not flow otherwise. There must be purification. There must be that before there can be baptism and communion. Now, our function as students, as we read the writings or hear the recordings, is to watch for these principles and then be sure that we take periods during the day or night to put them into practice. Because reading them alone is not sufficient. Even hearing them over and over and over again is not sufficient because that can really become just another form of hypnosis or suggestion, another form of affirming ourselves into something. Let us not read for the purpose of hypnotizing ourselves into believing what we read. Let us not hear with the purpose of being hypnotized into believing. Let us both read and hear with our spiritual senses wide awake so that we can learn what is required of us. Because there is, with every reading and with every hearing, there is something required of us, and that is, go thou and do likewise. Put into practice what you are hearing, uh, what you are reading. Then, as we sit back in our daily meditations, We can practice the presence of God. We can consciously realize where I am, God is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, just as that came into my thought, I was stopped. Here is an illustration of the very start of tonight's work. I'm going to repeat that. 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, at first thought, you may say, oh, but God is everywhere. And while, of course, that's true in what is called an absolute sense, it isn't doing uh, very much, that Spirit of God, for the sick and the sinning, the dying, the dictators. It isn't doing much for this world of turmoil. What's missing? This. The consciousness of the presence of God. The consciousness of the Spirit of God. That is where liberty is. That is what makes the difference between your practitioner, healer, teacher, and his self when he was a businessman or herself when she was a housewife. There is the difference. Always you may have known that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but your being around didn't free anybody. But now, as the practitioner or healer or teacher, now it does. What is the difference? Before, you intellectually knew that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but now you have attained the Spirit of the Lord, the consciousness of it, the awareness of it. Now it's here, consciously realized, and to some it's visible, to others it can be felt. In others, uh, sin disappears, desire disappears, fear disappears, hate disappears, even disease disappears. But only the experience of an individual who has attained that consciousness of the Spirit of the Lord, that is where liberty is. Now, here is how that is achieved. Since we have already been ordained, we have already been uh, called in order that we may prepare ourselves for the ordination so that we too, like the Master, can say, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. I am ordained to go out into this world and be a blessing, to be a benediction to all who contact me, all who recognize me, all who seek me out, all who are led to me. Everyone who is led to my consciousness must be blessed. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me and it has ordained me to set free the captives. Of sense. Now, in your daily meditation from now on, in at least one period of your daily meditation, realize consciously this point. First, that I have consciously purged myself of human opinion of holding anyone in human condemnation or criticism or judgment. I have freed this world to live or die according to its own consciousness. I have released man from the bondage of condemnation. There is now, therefore, no condemnation in my consciousness. I look upon all mankind as my brother, sister, and that the Spirit of God in me may bring release, freedom from material sense to all who contact me. And I honestly and openly declare that I don't mind whether they are friend or enemy who receive this blessing. To me, it is of equal importance that any individual and every individual ultimately bend their knee to God. 
Therefore, it is my joy if friend or foe receive this benediction and blessing since I am holding no man in condemnation. I am declaring, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Let thy grace shine upon them. Open their consciousness to thy presence. Then as you sit quietly waiting, you are opening yourself for that Spirit of God to be upon you. That when it comes, it sets you apart, and then all those who come into your presence are given their release or freedom in whatever degree they can accept it from material sense. In your first meditation or in your first year of meditation, you may not receive that full realization of the presence or the Christ. You may not be told the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you and you are ordained. You may receive that Spirit of God in little bits. A little bit of the Spirit may come today and free you from some fear, from some animosity, hate, jealousy. A little bit of that Spirit may touch you tomorrow and free you from some illness, from some lack or limitation. Bit by bit, this Spirit makes itself evident in our experience until that day of transition, and usually a day in which we're not expecting it. And all of a sudden we realize we have made the transition, and now the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and now I am a benediction, a blessing, to all who touch my consciousness. Remember this. <clears throat> Don't expect that everyone you meet is going to be instantaneously freed of all their sins and diseases. There are many who are not receptive or responsive to the Christ, who respond only to material sense. They would recognize you if uh, you came down the street in... Uh, a magnificent Cadillac, and, uh, oh, there is success. But if you come down the street robed in the Christ robe, they may not even see you walking by. Do not expect that they will receive the benefit that Peter, in his recognition of the Christ, receives. Do you follow that? Do you see that those who come to you, while all might equally receive the benefit, just as all who came to Jesus could have received it, he wasn't withholding any, but some saw the vision and others came back the next day wanting some more loaves and fishes. That's the highest they saw was the loaves and fishes, and that's what they came back for. It is not your function to judge who is ready and who is not ready. It is not your function uh, to declare that it is your family who must instantly respond. Your family may be the last one in your entire circle to respond. You know that the Master, Christ Jesus, didn't have his family until he was almost ready for the crucifixion. That was when they awakened to his message and his mission and he had to go through most of his ministry without his family. That happens to many in this work. Although I'm sure that toward the end of every such ministry, there is a recognition, recognition given of the spiritual nature of the life lived by those who have dedicated themselves to the Spirit of the Christ and its service. Never forget this. The message of the Christ is to bless this world, and God has more pleasure in one sinner redeemed than the 99 who are not quite there. And so it is 
that we have no function to withhold from anyone. Even the woman taken in adultery must be told, neither do I condemn thee. No one must be held in condemnation, and God's grace and God's blessing must not be refused to anyone with or without the price, with or without their sanction, with or without gratitude. There must be no price upon the Spirit flowing out from you, although those not ready will not receive it, or they will receive it only in proportion to their readiness. That is not your judgment or mine. Our function is to be willing that friend and foe, up and down, all may equally partake of the nature of the Christ. For so it is ordained that in the end every knee must bend. And so it is, heaven help you or me, if we think by thought or deed to withhold this from any individual on the face of the globe, regardless of how undeserving they may appear to be to human sense. I have witnessed in my prison work some men who at first glance would seem to be absolutely impossible and uh, find that they were the first to receive the benefits. Why? Because their evil was an outer thing brought on them by outer conditions but their inner integrity had never wavered. That is often true that people do things that their inner selves condemn, but their outer selves are compelled for one reason or another to do. And we have no way of knowing where that is, where that receptivity is, and therefore we have no more power to withhold it than the sun has to withhold light or warmth. The sun shines. There is light and there is warmth, and it is available to those who bring themselves into the sun. And so it is, when the Spirit of the Lord God is upon thee, never believe that you can give it, never believe that you can withhold it, you are an instrument through which it pours. And you must be willing that it pour freely in any direction and in every direction and for the benefit of those who, by the grace of God, are led to receive it. Now, I sum this up. Making the declaration that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty does not produce liberty for anyone. But sitting in the silence, without words or thoughts, until that spirit comes, then uh, you will find not only that you are set free, bit by bit of everything in your way, but that those who are led to you are set free in proportion to their readiness their receptivity, their responsiveness, and above all things, their willingness to give up selfish desires. There, of course, you see, in the last analysis, is the biggest stumbling block to our spiritual progress. We want spirit, and we want it for something. And that we dare not do. We may only want the spirit for the spirit then let it do with us what it will do. Then do we receive the Spirit of the Lord God and it flows as freely out from us as it flows through us, to us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, if you wish to do some healing work, and you may begin this very night, those of you who haven't done it. This is the way. Make yourself an instrument through which the Spirit can flow. First purify yourself, purge yourself of all condemnation, then wait for the Spirit, 
and then let the Spirit do its work. Those who reach out to you for that help will receive it. You do not have to direct it in their direction. Their reaching out to you is the connecting link. You have no more power to direct the Spirit to anyone than the sunshine has to direct its rays to your garden. Your garden has to get in the way of the sunshine. Now, never believe that you can direct the Spirit to anyone. But anyone can tune in to the Spirit of God in you and be benefited even if you don't know that they are tuning in. For you are not directing or controlling the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is directing and controlling you. The Spirit of God is flowing in you and through you. And for what purpose? To heal the sick. And even if a woman presses through the throng and touches your robe, even invisibly, without your knowing it, she will be healed, or he. It is our patients who bring out the healing, not we. It is their turning to us, their tuning into that Spirit of God for which we are but an instrument, and they accept the healing, and they bring it to themselves. We are but, and we're supposed to be, pure beings who have no human likes or dislikes, no human desire for anyone. We are but the instrument through which the Spirit of God flows, hoping that this whole world will tune in and grateful for those who do and praying for those who are not yet awake. And so it is until tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock in another room in this building. In another room. And do you not wish to make an announcement? Good evening. Well, it's a good evening inside. But really, it is a testimony also, <clears throat> not only to the infinite way, but it is a testimony to your own receptivity that we can all be here this evening with as many handicaps as we seem to have. It is always a cause for rejoicing when we are presented with problems and are able to resolve them. One of my earliest experiences was in realizing how many people <clears throat> turn to truth purely for the purpose of finding a way to overcome their human problems and who measure their spiritual progress by how many problems they do not have. And this is a false measuring rod. There undoubtedly comes a time when the complete absence of problems means spiritual demonstration, harmony attained. Jesus attained that after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. But I'm afraid too many of us are trying to attain it before the crucifixion. And before the demonstration of resurrection, and it isn't going to be done. Let it be understood clearly that we will have to make our demonstration over the beliefs of what we call the human mind or the carnal mind before we attain complete 
liberation. Let me present it to you in this way. There was a time when I dreamed of having a hundred thousand dollars. And the reason I wanted it was that the income from it would make me independent and then I could be a practitioner without any worry. The day I became a practitioner, I had just exactly $250 in the world. And no human way of getting any more. That has been my salvation. Because when I speak to you now about demonstrating supply, I am not speaking from some textbook that I have read and passed an examination in. I'm speaking to you from the experience of having made the demonstration. When I speak to you about health, I am not speaking to you from the pages of a book that I have read. I'm speaking to you from the fact that in 1921, I was given three months to live by St. Luke's Hospital in New York City. And that many years later, I was given only a few hours to live. And so I have twice come back from uh, the experience of the other side and both times through spiritual demonstration. And so I speak to you of healing and of health from the standpoint of having demonstrated. What I haven't experienced myself, I have experienced in the lives of my patients and students. So that I may safely say to you that almost every problem of human existence has come to my experience, directly or indirectly, and that in a great measure these have been met. So it is that when we can prove that bad weather strikes, and all of these other claims of human experience cannot separate us from our spiritual mission, then we have made a step forward, because now we can say, God must have done this. God must have brought me here. God must have demonstrated for us over adverse circumstances. Therefore, we have a greater degree of faith, a greater degree of confidence, a greater assurance that that same God is always with us. It is not that we are primarily interested in human demonstration but that in order to demonstrate that the word becomes flesh, it is necessary to prove in our experience that harmony is the normal and natural state of being regardless of any human conditions that may claim power to interfere. However, at this point, we need to remind ourselves that we are not on the path of material demonstration, but of spiritual realization. And so I bring to you a question that came in, which will serve to illustrate this point. This says, 
I try so hard to show forth demonstrations for my relatives, for those around me, so that they will be convinced. Why can't they see? Well, of course, this is a hopeless task that the student is trying to accomplish. It's an impossible one. Even the master didn't succeed in that demonstration. And uh, how can we? To begin with, what is the demonstration that we wish to make? The demonstration of the realization of God. The demonstration of spiritual harmony, the demonstration of spiritual life and truth and love, the demonstration of spiritual peace, inner peace, inner oneness with God, inner communion with God. Now, if your friends and relatives aren't on the spiritual path, how can you convince them how could they see the demonstration even if you made it? Do you not see that a spiritual demonstration is only visible to those of spiritual apprehension, comprehension? Do you not see that in order to recognize the Christ, you must already have attained a measure of Christhood? Do you not know why it was that Peter alone could answer, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Master could answer, Flesh and blood hath not shown you this. The Father within has revealed it to you. In other words, your brain, your thinking capacity, your intellect could never reveal to you that I am the Christ. That is something that only spiritual vision and spiritual intuition can bring to you. Therefore, Scripture says, if you raise them from the dead, they would not believe. And have you not seen it over and over and over again that you have witnessed a wonderful spiritual healing and someone has said, oh, nature would have taken care of that or... Oh, they probably weren't as sick as they thought they were. Oh, the x-ray plates were wrong. There was some dust on them that looked like a cancer. <laughs> have you not heard those things? If not, you must have heard about them. No, those of you who are spiritual students may offer to your friends and relatives a cup of cold water you may recommend to them that they try spiritual healing or spiritual teaching. You may offer them a pamphlet or a book, but you should not go further than that. In other words, we are living in an age where individual freedom is a most valuable asset. Probably it began, well, of course, it began originally with the Greeks, centuries and centuries ago. This in, inner longing for freedom, this inner urge to be free, and uh, it came to light again in the French Revolution. It came to light at the time of the Magna Carta. It came to light with the Constitution of the United States. What were all these things except man's drive to be free? Politically free, religiously free, economically free, socially free. And uh, for the past hundred years, the drive has been in that direction. In the past 30 years, it has suffered a reversal a reversal which was predicted by the very men who 
brought forth the Constitution of the United States. They said that there was an element in freedom that could well destroy it, and it proved to be true, man's inertia. His unwillingness to fight for freedom, to protect the freedom that he has. Oh, yes, when it's taken from him, he will die to regain it. But while he has it, he will be negligent of it. He either will not go to the polls to vote, or he will allow himself to be influenced by anyone with a strong mind, and uh, thereby ultimately bring to pass that which we are witnessing in this age, free countries losing their freedom, free peoples losing their freedom, or having it endangered member of the Supreme Court of the United States said last month on a television program that our liberties were being taken away from us today faster than we ever gained them to begin with. That is because we have not been alert. Now, I bring this to your attention for this reason. You wish the freedom to study a spiritual teaching, and you wish the freedom to study and practice any spiritual teaching that you choose, and you cherish the freedom to leave any teaching you choose and seek another, and this is all your right. But is it not your relative's right to remain in their orthodoxy or in their materia medica if they so desire. And so just as you and I expect for ourselves complete freedom to live and to practice our spiritual teaching, so must we grant to our friends and relatives complete freedom to live the life they desire without interference from us. Now, of course, through love, if they saw us ill, they would recommend some favorite doctor or favorite remedy, and uh, that is their right through love. And it is our right through love to offer them a spiritual teaching or spiritual help. But we should go no further than that. And above all, realize why you will never be able to convince anyone of spiritual demonstration. I have brought this out to you before, that it is claimed that only about 500 people actually witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Out of all the multitudes whom he healed, the multitudes he fed and the multitudes he taught, only about 500 actually witnessed if indeed there were that many, the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection wasn't something that could be seen with physical eyes. The resurrection was something that had to be spiritually discerned. Notice how the master walking the earth after the resurrection spoke to several people without them recognizing him at first. Why? Their eyes did not see him. And only when he touched them spiritually did they awaken to the fact that they were witnessing uh, this great marvel. So it is. You cannot know spiritual truth with your mind. You can learn it with your mind by reading, studying, memorizing, but that is not really knowing it. The knowing takes place when uh, the intellectual perception has gone a step further and has become spiritual vision. If it were not for this, this class would not be taking place, nor would the last New York and Chicago classes 
have been necessary. Because when we finished our work, 1956 and 1957, and concluded with the Halico classes, the message was on paper and on tape. And so far as intellectual knowledge is concerned, there is no further place to go in our work. But in spite of the fact that the message is there, and you have the tapes, and most of you have heard them, nevertheless, we are going to have to go through this work time again and time again and time again until that knowledge which is here up in the head becomes uh, a knowledge in the heart or spiritual discernment. Now, it is for this reason that all of my 1956 and 1957 work has been made available to you on tape. Somewhere in England are all the tapes of the 1956 and 1957 work, and uh, they are still available to you, and I would strongly recommend that you make a much greater study of them in the next year or two than you have in the past year or two. And it is for this same reason that we are now going to make available to you the 1957 and 1958 work. No, it is the night you have the 1957, all of it. But the 1958 work, beginning with Australia, you are going to have all of the Australia work on tape. And you are going to have the two Chicago classes, and uh, the New York class. So that, and of course you will have this London class, so that you will have the complete 1958 work as a follow-up to the 1956 and 1957 work. And not only you are going to have it, but because of the work and the way things are arranged here in England, Manchester will have it, and the suburbs of London will have it, and uh, Australia and Africa will have it. Now, why are we so anxious that this be so? For one reason, it is absolutely necessary that you live with truth not only until you know it thoroughly with your mind, but until it has become a part of your very consciousness, until it has become so much a part of you that it is instinctive. And therefore, when you are faced with any phase of discord, of inharmony, you will be able to say, do not repress it. Do not hold it back, not even that cough back there. Let it come, let it come. It isn't a power, it isn't going to disturb us, and it isn't going to harm you. Unless you sit there trying to hold it back, believing that it is evil. It isn't evil, so let it come. Throw it at us. So eventually, you must come to see the meaning of a spiritual message. Now, I've had the joy Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday of being in meditation in preparation for this work, and I have made this notation. The subject of it is God power. We have heard so much about the power of God in scripture and religious literature that the belief became prevalent that God is actually a power to be used against evil. This resulted in the many forms of prayer, 
in which the power of God is invoked against one's enemies or against disease. Throughout the world now, in churches, temples, synagogues, and mosques, you witness millions upon millions of people gathering weekly or daily to pray that the power of God come to earth in some manner to destroy national or religious enemies, to destroy disease or overcome fears. It is more or less universally believed that the power of God can be so evoked, that God is a power over conditions that we do not like, and that man, by prayer, can influence God to start the annihilation of these enemies. Let it first be understood that God is not a power to be used by man. Let it be clear to you that you cannot influence God to do something to your enemy or to your disease. That you cannot invoke God power at your will. That your prayers will not change God's will or God's purpose, God's activity, or God's laws. In this way, you will stop the vain attempt to reach God for some purpose, regardless of how good that purpose may seem to you. This is the most important lesson you will ever receive on the spiritual path, because if you listen, if you heed, you will begin at once to turn from the Santa Claus concept of God, to seek an understanding of the nature of God as God is. In the material sense of life, man is always using one power to conquer another power. The army of bows and arrows overcomes the armies of spears. Then the revolver-equipped army conquers that of the bows and arrows. The machine gun and rifle overcomes the revolver. The cannon destroys the rifle and the machine gun army. Bombs overcome them all. And now, what next? Pills, herbs, medicines destroy disease. Surgery removes bad parts of the body. Light, hypnotism, psychology, battles nerves, appetites, and neuroses. Note this, that in every department of material life, two forces are always opposing each other, good and evil, and always one power is used to overthrow another power. And very often, one evil power is used to overthrow another evil power. When men discovered that they could not always rely on one power to destroy another, and when it was learned that a power which successfully combated another power today might not do so tomorrow, when it was realized, finally, that there are not enough material powers always at hand, to destroy these erroneous powers, men sought for something else, something new, something different, something more powerful. And so this type of God and prayer came into being as we witness on earth today. But this God has not performed according to schedule. Prayer has not succeeded in bringing God down to earth to do man's will. Both this man created, this man created God, and the human means of reaching him through prayer have failed. The troubles of the world are multiplied even after 5,000 years of invoking deity to smite our enemies. The question is, 
When will men stop this nonsense and begin to know God, whom to know aright is life eternal? The answer is, when you, the truth students of this generation, begin to understand God and demonstrate God in your experience, As there was one Moses to free multitudes of Hebrews, one Jesus to found a Christian world based on the understanding of God, so today there must be a handful here and there on the earth courageous enough to turn away from old outworn concepts of God and prayer, bold enough to explore new paths leading to God-realization. Now let us repeat, in the material sense of life, there are two opposing forces, good and evil, and there is a continuous reaching for more and greater power to overcome other powers. In the spiritual consciousness of life, this is not true. There are not two powers, there is just spiritual grace. The spiritual life has no conflicting forces or powers, no greater and no lesser. There is a divine grace governing God's creation. In spiritual wisdom there is no God power to use, to overcome anything, to change anyone or any condition. The power of God is a spiritual grace, caring spiritually for God's children. Do you begin to understand why the Master taught, resist not evil, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit? My peace give I unto thee, not as the world giveth, but my peace. Love thy enemies. Now we are in a world where there are not two powers or forces, where there are no conflicts, unless in your mind you create them again. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Do not permit your mind to entertain two powers or conflicting forces, lest your mind create enemies for you. In your spiritual awareness now, you will not pray to be healed of disease. You will not pray that God do something for you or for yours you will rest in him, in his grace. God's grace is ever with you. You need not seek it, strive for it, or even earn it or deserve it. It is where you are now. God's reign falls on the just and on the unjust. Neither do I condemn thee. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Rest back in this grace. Relax. Rest in the assurance that there are not two powers or two laws. Only God's law is. There are no other laws. There are only spiritual laws. There is no law of God to overcome material forces or powers. You live and move and have your being in spiritual life and love. And God's grace alone feeds, clothes, cares, sustains. Be assured of this. God is. And that prayer is the way of realization. But learn that God is not a power over other powers. God is. 
learn that prayer is not a way of getting God to do our will. Prayer is a resting in his grace, a silent communion. Prayer is an attitude of listening through which God speaks to us or reveals his grace in our experience. Only as we surrender the paganistic concept of God as Santa Claus or as an avenging presence or as a superpower over the world can we settle back in the assurance of his presence made tangible through grace. Release yourself from the belief of God as power into the awareness of God as love flowing as grace. Now, after our classwork is finished, or perhaps when this fall begins again, go back to the very first reel of the first Halico class and see how for two hours this subject was brought to your attention, how for two hours without stopping it was brought to light that God is love. Not that by your prayers you are going to make God love you or care for you, but that God already is love. Now, you see, the way we have lost this God experience is that we have developed a material sense in which we have come either to love, hate, or fear that which is in the manifest realm, that which Paul calls the creature. He warns against loving the creature more than the creator. But he could also have warned against fearing the creature more than trusting the creator. You see, God never created anything empowered to destroy God's universe. Isn't that clear? God never created anything empowered to destroy God's universe. And I am God's universe, and so are you. Call no man on earth your father, for one is your father, God. Therefore, you are children of God, spiritual offspring, then how could there be anything ordained to destroy you, to make you sick or sinful or dead or poor? Now, actually, since God created all that was made and all that God made is good, there is no such thing as a destructive power. There is no such thing, thing as a destructive law. There is no such thing as a devil or Satan because there never has existed anything except that which God created. Now, in the second chapter of Genesis, you find a second creation talked about. In the first one, which is the spiritual one, crops were in the ground before there were seeds. There was light before there was sun or moon in the sky. And man was given dominion over everything in the sky, the earth, and beneath the earth. But when you go to the second chapter of Genesis, you find a creation entirely different than the first. 
You find one in which there had to be material seeds. You find one in which there had to be a rib. And then there had to be a marriage. In other words, in the second chapter of Genesis, this world evolves out of a world that is already created. That is the basis of what we call communism today. There is so much of everything in the world and so many to divide it between and no recognition is given to the fact that there is an invisible universe pouring itself out into visible form faster even than we can use up that which is being created. Spiritual wisdom reveals that we do not live by bread alone. We do not live by that which is already created. If this whole wor world disappeared in one smash, those of you who have learned that you do not live on yesterday's manner would find a whole new world springing up again in the very next minute after the crash. That has always been the way. Back in the beginning of the Depression in the United States, you have no idea of how many men jumped out of windows and shot themselves. Why? Because of the disappearance of their money in that panic. You would imagine that the printing presses were going to stop running or that the intelligence that brought them their money wouldn't bring it back a second time. No, they had become so fascinated with form that when there wasn't any form to look at anymore, they were finished. The world was empty. But you see, those who had courage enough to stick around a while discovered that the same intelligence that made a man's living one time would make it another time, and that the cattle on a thousand hills would be there this year, next year, and the year after. Crops would be in the ground, more oil would be discovered, more gold, more platinum, more uranium, and uh, fortunes grew faster than they ever had before. And so it is that I'm saying to you, in your spiritual life, you do not live on yesterday's manner, and you do not live on effect. Whether that effect is crops in the ground or fruit on trees or money in the bank, you do not live on that. You live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You live by every word of truth that you can receive in your consciousness. If all this world drifted away from you, if your money and your friends and your relatives disappeared in some hollow cast, you, if you had learned not to fear the creature or unduly love the creature, but if you had learned to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, if you had learned to know that there is a spirit in man, you would not be phased by any situation in the outer realm, but you would pick yourself up and start all over again, and you would rise to higher heights than you ever had before. Now you know that many times in the history of the world, civilizations have been wiped out. But always a remnant remains, a remnant to start the new dispensation. And always the new dispensation is a bit further advanced than the former ones. Oh yes, in uh, perhaps every uh, age there will be periods like our last 30 or 40 years when men seem to go backward 
but they only seem to go backward for a very good purpose. That is, that they may lose some of their reliance on outer means, on material means, and develop a greater awareness of their spiritual capacities. One of the evidences of that is undoubtedly the experience that you are witnessing in France today. France, which is going through a terrific turmoil, but for what reason? So only so that the reliance which they've had in a false sense of government can be replaced with a, a higher sense of government. And sooner or later it will come. Whether or not it comes by de Gaulle, whether or not it comes in this particular year, is not the point. Every single bit of their reliance on their form of government has been proven to be a bad reliance on something that could not stand up in an emergency, and it has to be changed. Therefore, we go through these terrific trials and ordeals. Every country on the face of the globe has had to go through the same experiences in order that some evil part of their government could be replaced with something higher and something better. Every one of us as individuals have either had to lose our health or our supply in order to be brought to our knees in humility where we could say material means have failed me is there another way and then god has revealed himself and said yes i in the midst of thee am mighty why haven't you looked in that direction so it is never doubt this every material prop is going to be taken away from mankind. And he isn't going to like it. Not any more than these men like losing their fortunes in the Depression. Not any more than you like going through the Blitz. Not any more than we like 10 years of Depression. But remember this. It isn't a question of whether we like it. It is a question that in the end, every knee must bend to spiritual grace. In the end, everyone has to come to God. It is so ordained. We have come up from animals. We have come up from an animalistic state of consciousness. And we are progressing. We are progressing, as you can see, in your art galleries, in your museums. Wherever you look, you will find that mankind is progressing even though he has a 50-year or 100-year period of retrogression. And so it is that on this spiritual path, you and I are progressing. And I started out by saying that problems must needs be because it is these very problems that take from us our reliance on material power, whether it's the material power of money, the material power of medicine, the material power of government. Each one of us must come to the acknowledgement of God as our government, God as our supply, God as our health, God as the very temple of our bodies. How are we going to do that if we go around enjoying good health and good supply? We just will learn to rest on our good health and our good supply, and we'll have no need of God. It is by our problems that we are made to realize that we need that which is greater than the creature, that is, that which has form. Now, in what way have we worshipped form, and in what way do we still place our reliance on form? And then you will begin to perceive why you must rise above the material sense of existence. Watch this.
in the material sense of existence, there are two powers and you are always searching for some great power with which to overcome this discord. In many cases, you made the same mistake when you came to the mental way of life or the mental sciences. You look for some thought to hold on to, to overcome some error or discord. Always looking to one thing or thought to overcome another thing or thought, but not in spiritual wisdom, not in spiritual consciousness, and certainly not in spiritual healing. For in spiritual healing and spiritual living, you learn to relax and say, is there any power apart from God? Is there? Is there any power with which God has to contend? Is there any power that God must overcome? And if you persist in this contemplative form of meditation, ultimately you will say, I know not any. God is supreme, all, infinite. God is only. God is one. And beside God, there is no power. And beside God, there is no law. And beside God, there is no life. And beside God, there is no love. And when you come to that realization, you come to where I have been trying to lead you for some time into the realm of grace. Into the realm of grace where there are no more battles. You do not battle people. You do not battle ide ideologies. You do not battle. You rest. You rest and you learn to commune with God and contemplate God and understand that you live by his grace. You rise out of that material sense of existence where there are two conflicting powers, health and disease, sin and purity, false appetite and harmony. You rise above that to where there is only one and I am that one. I in the midst of thee am mighty. I am your bread and your wine and your water. I in the midst of you is the presence that goes before you to make the crooked places straight. Ye need not fight. The battle is not yours. Stand ye still. This is the state of grace that I am trying to reveal to you. The battle is not yours. God is the central theme of our existence, and God governs not by power, not by might, by his spirit. And he doesn't overcome. We overcome the belief that there is something to be overcome. We rise above uh, the fear of the creature, that which has form. Once it's in the form of a germ, infection, contagion. The next time it's in fear of a lack or limitation or a strike or a depression or a war, or a bomb. As long as there are forms, you will be made to fear forms until you come to the realization form is in power, creature is in power. Don't worship the creature more than you worship your creator. God alone, the spirit within you, is the all power, the only power, the divine power, and not a power over sin, disease, and death. In the presence of the power of God, there is no sin, disease, or death. In the presence of God, there is only life eternal. That's why we have been taught, if you know God aright, you have demonstrated life eternal, because you have understood God now as a divine, eternal, immortal state of grace, acting through grace, loving through grace, not by might, not by power, just by this gentle spirit. No longer will you fear the sins of the past, your own or anyone else's. 
No long will you fear physical might or mental powers, for you will live by grace. You will not live in an atmosphere where there is a continual warfare between one thing and another, not even a warfare between God and devil, but where God is so infinite and uh, all that there is no devil. The devil is absorbed right into God's allness. And just in that way do the so-called sins and diseases of mankind become absorbed until there's nothing left visible but the body of God, eternal, immortal, forever and forever. If only we could demonstrate this because we have learned it. But I say frankly to you that we can't. We can take this knowledge and we can use it and apply it each day as problems arise until one of these days, bit by bit, the complete conviction of it dawns in us and that all of a sudden the creature isn't uh, a dangerous form anymore, it's a companionable form. And we begin to see then that it was only Adam that named things good and Adam named things evil, but in and of themselves there never were any evil things, any evil beings, any evil persons. God constitutes individual being. God constitutes your being and my being. God constitutes his being and her being and its being, whether or not these others know about it. We do, and the response is to us in accordance with what we know. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Just remember this. If anything has form, even the minute form of an atom, don't fear it. Don't fear anything that has form, not even a thought. For there isn't anything that can come nigh thy dwelling place. Since in God consciousness, there are not two powers. There is only one. Nothing to be overcome. Nothing to be destroyed. Nothing to be changed. Merely that our eyes be opened, that we may behold him as he is, and we will be satisfied with this likeness. Perhaps as you look around you with your eyes, you see erroneous forms, things that you call sin, disease, death, lack, limitation. But be assured of this, that once you have retreated from the belief in two powers, you will no longer behold an enemy. They will have destroyed themselves. They will have wiped themselves right off of the battlefield. The moment you are able to rest in that realization, why shall I fear any cre creature more than I should understand God, the creative principle of all creatures? Why should not I love and trust the creative principle of all creation? Why should I be made to fear that which has form? Did not God create all that was created? This is the atmosphere in which I want to leave you. And so, at this moment, let us all meditate. And in this meditation, ponder. Ponder the great world in which you live. in which there are no powers external to you. And the only power within you is the grace of God. You need not pray to it for anything. You need not tell it of your needs. It is infinite intelligence. It is divine love. It knoweth your need before you do and it is its good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Rest in it. Rest in my grace. 
my grace is thy sufficiency in all things. Be a beholder and watch God's grace flow as you withdraw from the battle of life. as you withdraw from the struggle to overcome, to destroy, to change, as you settle back in the assurance, God's grace is my sufficiency in all things. I live not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Rest back in me and know that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look unto me, the kingdom of God within you, and be saved. <coughs> Thou shalt not fear what mortal man can do to you. Thou shalt not fear what mortal condition can do to you. God's grace is thy sufficiency. If you make your bed in hell, it will be there. If you make mistakes, it will be there. To the storm at sea, Jesus only said, Peace, be still. He did not fight with the wind or waves. He did not try to overcome them. Peace, my peace give I unto thee. My peace. Thank you for this beautiful communion and you will help the entire atmosphere of the class if you can possibly be here 15 minutes early and meditate because you must remember this, truth does not come out of books. Truth comes from the deep withinness. It is not only brought forth by one person, it is brought forth because two or more are gathered together in this name and in this nature. It takes all of us uniting in God consciousness to be such a stillness, such, such a peace, that out of the depths of our one consciousness, the one which we have attained, out of the depths of that can come deep messages. Just remember, the mind of man can't give or create a message like this. Nobody can learn it. It has to come from the depths, but you help to create that depth. That is why we have a teaching that says where two or more are gathered together in unselfishness, in unselfedness, only for the purpose of receiving from God, not from man, from God, through man, yes, but from God. And so to bring all this to light, we need each other. Thank you.